my guess is it'll be kind of a wash. Um, is it an issue that that other component is not exposed? Because when it's tucked in the tire, uh, it is exposed to like you know surrounding. So. Um, good question. It would be dependent upon what kind of um, debris the car has to go through. If this was going through a forest or tree limbs, I would be worried about it. Yeah. But my guess is there's nothing that could hit it. Nothing too critical. I, I can't think of anything yeah. that would hit it. Yeah. Uh, is that blue line the came in? Yes. So does that actually work through exist yes. on the rear car? Um, not as, as a, a straight line. Not as a pin, but it is definitely a real phono a physical phono uh, it's, No, you don't see it anywhere. It's just a virtual dotted line. Okay. So I guess I'm thinking, could you put the top ball joint up outside the tire so that that blue line would like cut through the tire? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. There's no no problem with that. Right. That is no no issue at all. The the tire can do that as long as your physical. Um, structure. So the blue line is, is, is in the virtual line. So the physical structure of the upright would curve around. Okay. And that's not too hard to do. No. So <clears throat> we, we wanted to move like the knuckle out of the tire to increase the distance between the two arms uh -huh. to lower the cornering force. Uh huh. Then Brock just said. Well, when you lower the or when you raise the upper arm ball joint, doesn't that raise the force that it's feeling from the cornering force? Did you say it was a wash? Is that what you said? Uh, it, it should lower it actually. So if I make the four high, if I make that four to eight mm -hmm. by moving this point from here to there, then that force will go that go down by fifty percent. Right. And this one will also go down by fifty percent. But isn't well, your ball joint no longer at thirteen inches? Yeah. It's oh, you're right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, but the four is changing faster than the thirteen. Much okay. faster. Yeah. So you still you, you, you're going to see a greater force, but you're, you're cornering force, but you're going to like mitigate yeah. that force by. Yeah. Thank you for catching that. It's not just the four. Okay. But the four. If you double the four, it only changes that by twenty percent. Okay. But that's worth it. It's worth it. Yeah. Usually. Okay. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, you roll like sideways uh -huh. that um, ball joint hit the ground that busted this oh if you roll over yeah yeah uh, maybe it depends on your roll hoop um, it depends whether your roll hoop hits <laughs> that's back in um, uh, 1988 I worked for Ford on the suspension for the Thunderbird this is their spindle um, or they're upright. That little guy there, and there's the upper wall going way up there. Whoa. Wow. Hmm. That's pretty common. Lots of cars have these little very long spindles. That's still structurally sound as upright. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So they use a solid forging, so it's fairly heavy. Yeah. But you can make it out of chromoly tubing and make it very light. Do you know why most cars haven't done this? Um, most Baja cars? Yeah. I don't. I only saw one. I think it was um, um, SDSU. Oh, really? Yeah. They probably don't think of it. That would be my guess. But. Yeah. So it seems like a lot of the stuff in the suspension is like you can do one design modification to like increase some like criteria, but when you do that, it limits another criteria. So all it's all nice. like a it's like a balance that we need yeah. to find. Yeah. What would you say are like the like the top three things that we need to account for? That's the three like, most important. Yeah, that's a great I question. I have to think about it. Okay. Um, particularly for Baja. Yeah. If, if we're road racing, I can give you the answer right away. Right. Um, okay. So, cool stuff. Is this cool stuff? It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Let's um, so, we looked at forces very nicely. We looked at packaging issues. So um, the rack means we're probably not going to get down to six. Um, let's, for now, put this up here. Hmm, I wonder if, hmm. This, yeah, the steering is going to play into this. We have to look at the aftermath question in order to fully answer where these points go. 
but let me continue with this as a reasonable guess. Uh, can you briefly said I a few times? And I know we've watched that video. Can you briefly? But what is it? Yeah, because it is important. Um, it's like oh, it's like overcompensating this year. Yeah, and it, it means. Um, that the inside wheel is turning more than the outside wheel. So this car is going around a right turn. The whole car is, is rolling about that center of rotation. That would be like the center of the corner. Um, in order for um, both tires to be rolling perpendicular to its travel, then the inside wheel has to turn more. Um, otherwise, the t one of the other tires tends to scrub itself. Yeah. Yeah. Now, how do you achieve this? Maybe this would be a good time to talk about Acme, because this does matter. Um, what do you think? Should I switch to Acme? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's linkage. The big question is, is it a front steer or a rear steer? Front steer means that the steering rack is in front of the front axle. Rear steer means that it's behind the rear. <coughs> front steer means that the steering um, rack is in front of the uh, front spindle. And rear steer means it's over here. And they have big, big differences for how they um, affect Ackerman. Oh, this is good. I'm happy when I can see the right picture. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a rear steer vehicle. The steering arms are um, coming to the back, and then the rack's back here. Uh, can you, let me look at all the pictures, we'll pick the best one. Maybe that's, that's a good one. Yeah, we'll go between this one and the, the next one. Um, can you imagine, let's make this the inside wheel. As I turn the wheel, these tie rods are going to go that way in order to turn the wheels that way. Can you imagine how this angle starts to approach a toggle position as I steer the, into the inside? If something is, as it's approaching the toggle position, it's going to turn that wheel faster and faster. So that's why in a rear steer vehicle, if you, uh, let's go out to parallel steering, that's the default case over here. So if I just have parallel steering, no Ackerman, here's the wheel, here's the wheel, there, so that's the steering arm, and here's the rack, what did I make the rack before, red, okay, there's the rack. Um, this is just a parallelogram. If you move that rack and back and forth, you have zero Ackerman. The steering tires always point exactly the same direction. So in order to get Ackerman on a rear steer vehicle, we have to move these points in. And uh, it will give you a progressive Ackerman. Because initially, this is pretty close to 90, and that's pretty close to 90, so they move pretty much parallel. But as they turn more and more, this one is going to oh, this one is going to approach its toggle before that one approaches its opposite toggle. Let me follow that. So um, let's try that again. Uh, this this angle will be toggle when it approaches 180. This angle will be toggle when it approaches zero. When this point is all the way out here and if the two arms um, go like that. Once, they, once something approaches toggle, the forces go to infinity and the motion goes to infinity as well. Or one of the motions goes to infinity, the other one goes to zero. Uh, meaning that, um, this is the easier one to imagine. If I move <coughs> this over here and that will put it 180, I only need to move this a thousandth of an inch and this steering arm will 
pull really quickly. So that's what you want for Ackman. If you have the points inboard, uh, this one will reach its toggle before that one does. And so that's good because we're, um, not that you want to actually get the toggle, but just um, in terms of like how fast things are moving, that's good because you can get that inside wheel to turn uh, faster than the outside wheel. Uh, so that's <coughs> rear steer, and that's the typical solution to get Ackerman. The reason is just for front steer, you can, so let's now imagine um, the steering in front of the rear wheels, in front of the front wheels. Wait, so I just have a quick question. So that would be symmetric, right? Yes, I don't know why they have twin. I think there are maybe. Um, I mean, there are different angles shown, but. This is some weird case where they've got different angles. Yeah, yeah. they're up there would normally be symmetric. Okay. It only turns left. Oh, this was a picture, I think, of that approaching that toggle position. So here, uh, this is a very old steering design. It's not a rack and pinion, it's a, called a drag link. But ignore that. Just think of this point as your inner tie rod on the left side. That's the inner tie rod on the right side. Um, the steering, this, the angle we were talking about is between there, there, and there. So that is very close to 180. But over on this side, there, there, and there, that's nowhere close to zero. So that, that's why this one's turning faster. Uh, let's, let me get a front steer um, example of how to do that come in. It's not nearly as popular. It can be done, but there's a packaging issue. steer it's just flipped so that's the front of the car that way uh, in order to achieve Ackerman steering in the front steer vehicle with that in front of the rear axle look at the um, oh they just got that square normally this point needs to be that way and if um, we're already packaging ourselves close to the brake disc and the brake caliper then well mostly the brake disc Often you just can't get that point to go that way because it's in the brake disc or you can move everything else in. But there is another trick you can do and that is to move the front, move the rack that way. So instead of, so this is pretty much straight there even though the red is angled, these are at the same angle. Notice that this point is not straight in from there. By putting this, the rack that way, as I turn, as I move this rack that way, this is the inside wheel, and you can get that angle to open up faster than the other one. It's not as effective, but it, um, it, it's, it's a, it can work. If you really want to put a rack in front, we can make that work, but it's much better in the rear, than behind the axle. Uh, okay, questions on half I saw a lot of cars use reverse Ackerman. Yeah, dumb. Uh, no, no good reason that I can think of. Okay. What is reverse? Uh, anti Ackerman. It's where um, the outside tire turns more than inside. Yeah. Yeah. That was occasionally there are there are cars that do it, and I don't, I don't know why. Um, it's. Did that produce a bunch of like fender steer? Yeah, yeah. It makes the tire scrub. Yeah. Um, <coughs> there occasionally you see a car doing it and that it, it likes it, but my guess is that the reason it likes it is because it's fixing some other problem that isn't totally unrelated. You know, it's like two accidents that actually work out to be an improvement. Okay. How does the actual like? I guess I don't know much about this. How does the actual like when you when you turned your wheel? 
How does that like motion actually turn your tires? Oh, yeah, the steering linkage. Okay, yeah. So now that's the rack and the uh, U joints. Okay. So steering, um, rack, wheel, U joint, the steering column. It would probably be called. Universal joint there. That's to redirect the direction of the uh, shaft. Another universal joint there. Then it feeds into the rack and pinion right there. So the shaft will drive a pinion gear, and the pinion gear will drive the rack. So let's just do rack and pinion so we'll make sure everyone knows what that is. So the simplest rack and pinion would be like that. Uh, so that's rotating. Um, this is captured very well, and that slint slides the rack back and forth. And then at the end of this, you typically they provide a threaded hole of some kind that you can put a rod in on and come up to it. So the pinion is fixed. It's sliding yeah, the rack. Yeah, the pinion's fixed. The rack slides. Yeah. Um, here's another example. Universal joint, universal joint. Notice that the universal joint, so did they teach you in machine design that um, universal joints don't have constant speed as they rotate. Did you learn that? How many know that already? Let me see the room. Um, so it's, it's kind of a detail. I don't, we don't need to go into it. But you can, um, the idea is that if this one rotates at, let's say, 100 RPM very steadily, if you look at the speed of this shaft right here, it's not a steady 100. It's doing 99, 101, 99, 101. And it has to do with the, the mechanics of how that universal joint work. However, if you have two universal joints, all you need to do is have one of them phased like this. See the U is there? And the other one has the opposite phase. See the U is there. And then those two things cancel out. So, don't you use two CV joints on a independent rear suspension drive chain? Yeah. Uh, so in, in the old days, we didn't have so. There's universal joint, which is one way of redirecting a, a shaft. So I have a rotating shaft, rotating shaft. Universal joint was the first way of figuring out how to do that with a spider, um, and that will have constant to non-constant speed. And the more angle you have the more difference, like it can be dramatic, like this can be going 20% slower and then 20% faster. Um, then they said, boy, this is a pain. Uh, and some other reasons why they didn't want universal joints. They invented a new type of joint called a constant velocity joint. So it's kind of like, I can kind of do it with my fingers here. So it transmits speeds at the same uh, RPM input and output. That's why it's called a constant velocity joint, C, um, instead of some other name. Um, it uses balls between the, the input and the output, and the balls are always at the same radius. Uh, so you always need two. Uh, your question was... Um, yeah, so I guess my question is why couldn't you put U joints if they're a little more robust than CVs sometimes? Ah, why don't you use U joints in the rear axle? Right. Ah, okay. Yep, that's that's a good. Question. I mean, we don't have to like go launch into it, but maybe it's yep. a question for another time. Um, let's yeah, let's keep that on the list. That's an important one. Uh, okay, so so that answers your question on how does the steering system work? Yep. Okay. Kind of jump around, but that's okay. Let's see. Let's try to bring it back. Um, unless there's if there's pressing questions, let's answer them now. But if not, let's try to kind of pull back to where we were um, on this packaging and steering issue. Let's see. So we want rear steer. We can. That means that if we have rear steer, then 
our um, our outer tie rod is probably here, roughly. We want it, um, well, it's compromised. Uh, and, oh, there's one more factor, which is that. This is the steering arm, um, steering arm, torque arm. You can imagine that the length of this arm will also be important. If it's really short, you're going to have poor control on the wheels, and you turn the steering wheel a little bit, and the wheels turn instantly. If it's really long, then you have to turn the wheel like three turns. <laughs> um, so you want it some medium distance for that reason, and also, uh, if it's too short, and it takes some torque to turn the wheels, the force in that rack will be very, very high. We don't want that either. So you want a reasonable length of it. Um, I'm going to guess three inches, four inches, something like that. So in order for this to be a reasonable length, then it can't be all the way up here and still be inside the rim. Um, maybe it could be outside the rim. Maybe the fact that that's a little bit in will get that outside the rim. I'm not sure. That's quite possible. Uh, maybe it could be even above the rim if you have a tall, if you do this solution. That would be a really high rack. Um, I don't know, it might work. It would be unusual. Uh, so where is all this going? This is all going for where are we going to put the steering rack? Um, if it is here, then that's this dotted line here. And that puts the rack there. So is that going to be in the way of the driver's feet, or the pedal package, or can you work around it? Uh, these are the kind of issues we have to look at. Okay, and then that relates to how wide are these points going to be? Because we know that's where we have to jump back and forth between this one. We know that for no bump steer. That the length of this tie rod, this length right here, must be proportional to the dotted lines from the through, through the other suspension joints. Um, we know for Ackerman steering, the rear steer, these points have to be inboard that way. So this point is not here. It has to be a little bit inboard there. That means this point has to also be a little more inboard there. That means the rack is getting scratched. So we want a short rack. Okay. So that all this is, is the re all this is headed towards um, what is a feasible width for these points. Do you like a five minute break? Oh, thank you. Yes, perfect. Colin, do you have a concert yesterday? Yeah. How's it?
and yeah. user yeah. don't allow late yeah. change. Yeah. Do you see these? Like Some see it, yeah. The uh, on cars. That's why they just look at the squishy thing. It's a spline. They'll have a spline. Or they'll have a, 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 a donut. Um, so if you have U-Droids, you have to also either have the spline or some way to have length change. Okay. But something you have three parts. Why not just have two turns? CVs. Right. Okay. Right. Because you'd have to have some other thing that yeah. allows length change. And those seat, those um, those splines that allow the thrust or the um, change in length, they tend to not be very smooth. Uh, but you have, to, you have to design them really well for them not to bind up. You're, so you're talking about the CV? Yeah. Uh, no. If you use um, if you use U-Droids. Yeah. And you have a spline, and, so. and that spline has to be done very well, or it will, will tend to bind, and then the whole rear suspension binds. Interesting. Uh, a CV joint, some CVs will not allow, um, what's the, there's a name for it, it you know, thrust or a plunge, that's it. Some CV joints will not allow plunge, others will. It depends on the design. Okay. So all cars will have typically their inner CVs be the non plunge, and their outer CVs be the plunge. Interesting. Okay. Like inboard, yeah. outboard, or yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in either way. Um, it's so the yeah. outboard one. Yeah, the ones by the wheel so allow the plunge, and the ones so inside don't. No. That's the typical. But so as far as you know, it doesn't matter. So the A arms like don't provide enough. Is, is, is it that the A arm, the A arm track width is change is not accurate enough to? Right. Okay. okay. It's, okay. In general, it's not practical to. Place is, well, like if you have a trailing arm system, it's um, more. There's no way to get the wheel to go up and down, and to have that half shaft stay the same length. Oh, wow! Yeah, yeah. And roll bar connected to that more half shaft. I don't know what that is. I think it's a bumper. Oh, oh that's not a roll bar. Yeah. Oh, you can tell whether it's a plunge or a non-plunge. This is a plunge CD. See how long it is? Oh, yeah. And that's a non-plunge out there. Okay, interesting. All right, thank so, you. Yeah, for semi trail arms, you've got to have one CV be a plunge type it. on each side. Mm -hmm. And for, yeah. for A arms as well, it's in general not practical to line up the rotation point of that one to coincide with the rotation of these. It's too much work. Okay. Plunge solves all kinds of problems. Okay, <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah, good. Well, that's a great question. Um, so let's look at some examples of how other cars have pulled this off. Okay, so here's a car with ball joints um, at rim height. And can't see much else. Um, so that, that's a trailing arm? Or it's like a three leaf thing. This would be this would be short long arm in yeah. the back with a trailing arm for the longitudinal location. So so what do the what do the short long arms keep help you with? Um, they behave just like a double A arm in the front view. So notice this in terms of camber control and roll center. As long as your um, lateral locating links are shaped like that, your longitudinal link can be whatever you want. And that's only for the, the force of the bumps. The, the cornering. The, yeah. yeah. For the, no, well, the, the trailing arm is only for that progression and recession. Uh, right. The trailing arm will take your four aft loads, and it will define the four aft location of the wheel. Uh, Anti squat, um, the pre preset, uh, recession, things like that. So if you only have one arm in the back, that's a swing axle? Yeah. If you only have one lateral arm, that would be a swing axle. Yeah. And that, why is that so bad? Very high roll center um, yeah. and tuck under. That's a that's a Volkswagen Bug or an early Corvair. Uh, it's those ones where the wheels are trying to tuck under the car. And then, what about a purely trailing? Oh, that's fine. Yeah. But, so when I say only one arm in the back, if 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 you only have one arm going to the side to side, one lateral arm. Back. No, yeah, I know. Yeah. I'm now I'm asking about the trailer yeah. arm. What if you just did a pure trailer arm? Uh, then you have a roll center on the ground, and so you have extra roll angle because you have more roll on the arm. Yeah. <laughs> That's why semi trailer arms are more popular because you can get a higher roll center. What would the semi trailer like? If if you moved that trailing arm, how would you move that trailing arm to make it a semi trailing arm? Um, it would be a totally different design. If you wanted semi trailing arm, take out the back. Take out those two lengths. This would not be practical. Your other pivot point would have to be like 
under the carve out there. Uh, we can look at symmetry moves in a bit. Okay. Yeah. Let, let me stick with front suspension because we just talked about that. Um, so here's another one with um, lower ball joint well off the ground, big distance there you can see for ground clearance. Upper ball joint within the rim, probably just um, five inches or so there. In terms of motion ratio of the spring, remember that from last time? Yeah. This would have a pretty good motion ratio because the spring is relatively vertical and it's actuated pretty far out on that lower A-arm. This would have a very poor motion ratio. The spring is way inclined out over. However, they do get it um, actuated way outside. So they, that's very good. Uh, you can see that the, the packaging issue on the spring is can you get the upper arm to go around it? So they had to bend their upper arm to get around that. This team chose to have straight arms and then incline the spring way over. Neither are especially great solutions, but I would vote for that one over this one probably. See, this one has a steering rack. You can barely see it right there. I think it's rear steer. I can, it doesn't look like it's in front. When you're talking about um, when Davis was in the, the length of the steering rack, so we can have a front frame that was like four inches on yeah. the bottom. That looks really small. It does. We so might not have a fifth steering rack. It, it looks like it goes out from yeah. the front. It's and they put it more back in the yeah. front compartment. Yeah. And he says about 12 inches. It's very fit. The most popular one is 11 and 14 inches. Yeah, they said neither of this is a good spot. Oh, sharing rack? Yeah. Shorter should be 11 long. You could make your own rack, too. Right. Is the shearing rack not at the bottom of the frame or inside the frame? Anywhere. Really? Most of the mountain sure probably looks much. So can it be outside? What's the problem? Um, just that the points can't be too far. The, the, the restriction is this point. The restriction is the length of your tie rod. Oh, uh, the length of the tie rod has to track the relative heights of the arms. And then usually it's slid a little bit inboard for Ackerman, so that point gets in there. No, I get the whole. Let's see. Dr. I got a little bit of the versus this tricky. So it looks like this, this A arm got a dent in it right here. 